Hello and welcome back to History 2065. As you may have noticed, I am not Dr. Newell. Now, if you don't remember me from my introduction video, my name is Sarah Paxton and I am your graduate teaching associate. I am the one who's been grading your discussions, your internet assignments, and most recently, your essay. Don't worry, you guys are doing all right. Keep it up. But today, 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 I am your lecturer. So ladies and gentlemen, buckle up because this is History According to Daniel D. Lewis, the Five Points Edition. All right, so because I am not going to be lecturing off of, I forgot to introduce Paisley. Because I am not going to be lecturing off of PowerPoint slides like you've been used to with Dr. Newell, I'm going to give you a brief verbal rundown of my outline. So then if you're taking notes, and I certainly hope you are, then you'll be able to keep up and it'll make more sense, I suppose. I'm going to start with a basic background into the five points. I'll pull up some maps, uh, talk about the setup, things like that. And then we're going to go into immigration uh, with the potato famine in Ireland and then we're going into uh, politics. And in politics, it's where we get the gangs, uh, especially the ones that you see in the movie, The Gangs of New York. And the gangs, we're going to go into more social issues, such as poverty, tenement buildings, alcoholism, stuff like that. And from there, we're gonna go into crime. I'm going to focus predominantly on violent crime, specifically homicide and discuss what the death rates were, what they are uh, by the end of the movie, and how many of those would actually be classified as homicides. And just because it's kind of fun, I have a narrative up that I wrote from a coroner's inquest into the death of Andrew Mahan in the Sixth Ward during the early 19th century that you can take a little look at. Uh, and that's the basic rundown of what we're doing. I might veer off a little bit, we'll see. But let's get started. So as I said earlier, we're going to be starting with what the five points is. Before you can really know what the five points is, you need to know where it is. So let's pull up a couple maps. So this is a map of the lower part of Manhattan in 1857, which actually isn't too far away from our time period uh, around the time of the draft riots. If you look at the map, you can see a the blue in the center, kind of oddly shaped, is called the Sixth Ward. Uh, the Sixth Ward is where you find the five points. What we're looking at here is a blown up map of the Sixth Ward in particular. Uh, this map is taken from a book written by Dr. Tyler Ambinder, who is a professor at a George Washington University in Washington, DC, uh, who was actually a consultant for the movie, The Gangs of New York, because he is easily the leading expert on the neighborhood. Uh, he, the reason he was chosen as a consultant for this particular movie is he wrote what is one of the most important pieces of work on the five points that exist because it's based on a whole slew of primary sources that really aren't available today um, because the artifacts turned up during the archaeological dig were then kept in an archaeological lab in the basement of the World Trade Center so they were destroyed on September 11th. Uh, what we're looking at on this map and what's really important and you should be looking for are four streets that are Orange, Cross, Anthony, and Little Water. If you look at, there's an arrow pointing into the intersection of Orange, Cross, and Anthony uh, at kind of a five point, which is where it gets, it gets the name. Uh, and that is the five points neighborhood. And then if you move a little bit to the west, you have uh, the Little Water uh, on the side and in the middle there was Paradise Park, which if you remember correctly, played a very large role in uh, the Gangs of New York film. Paradise Park was at the center of the Five Points and it wa it had gates surrounding it and it's where people, a lot of people would hang out outside. They would hang their, their laundry up to dry and uh, oftentimes uh, people would hire um, little orphan children or the children who were running around to guard their clothes to make sure nobody steals them. So now that you know more about where the Five Points is, let's get into who lived there. The Five Points was a distinctly ethnic district. Dr. Tyler Ambinder, who I mentioned earlier with the maps, 
uh, says that about a full 89% of the residents in the Five Points were foreign born. A uh, large number of these immigrants typically arrived from economically impoverished sections of European countries such as Germany and Ireland. And the Five Points slum was the only neighborhood that the impoverished Irish could afford. So many settled in the Sixth Ward. One of the important reasons that the majority of the immigrants moving into the Five Points were Irish and German is not just because of their economic status, but why they had that economic status. The biggest problem in Ireland and Germany in the time period we're looking at, which is roughly the 1840s and 60s, is the potato famine. In Ireland, 60% of the population lived in what officials referred to as fourth class housing which referred to dilapidated sod huts of the absolute lowest economic class in Ireland. Uh, these residents who lived in fourth class uh, depended almost wholly on the potato for nutrition. Since it was found that a diet of potato would lead to no severe life-threatening vitamin or mineral deficiency. Because a large majority of the Irish depended on the potato, and only the potato, as a means of sustenance, the potato famine, which occurred between 1845 and 1851, was devastating to the laborers of Ireland. During the famine years and the period of economic depression that followed, there was a large wave of emigration from Ireland and other states that were hit with the famine, such as Germany, and searching for work because the some of the lords who, the English lords who still owned where the land that they lived on found it would be cheaper to ship them off to the U.S. instead of trying to feed them until the famine clears up. Searching for work, these immigrants settled in the bustling city of New York uh, because that's where their boats landed and, and they didn't have the money to travel anywhere else in the U.S. So they settled in the cheapest part of the city, the Five Points. Despite being all Irishmen, there were still definite divisions within the immigrant Irish ranks. These were typically drawn along county lines, like if somebody was from the county Sligo or county Kerry or something of that sort. And it is along these lines that the first American street gang was drawn. gang was called the 40 Thieves, and what made it different from any other organization that tried to call itself a gang was the establishment of a hierarchy. Uh, the groups that came before it were sociologists typically just consider them um, troublesome like groups of orphans that would pickpocket and different minor criminal activity, but they didn't have the same organizational definition that the 40 Thieves did. The 40 Thieves were born out of a grocery store speakeasy that was run by a woman named Rosanna Pierce. Rosanna Pierce sold really high proof alcohol out of her back room, which of course drew in the immigrants. These immigrants that visited Rosanna Pierce's grocery store slowly formed what was eventually considered the 40 Thieves and the groundwork for street gangs in America, which sociologists agree haven't changed much. So if you're picturing the gang activity that goes on in urban street settings today, it's pretty much the same way that it was in the 1820s. While the 40 Thieves ruled the Five Points for over 10 years, other gangs did quickly break rank and start forming their own organizations. Uh, you've heard a lot of them in the movies. You had the Plug Uglies, who had those giant plug hats stuffed with cloth, uh, which was used kind of as a makeshift helmet for battles, because if something hit all the cloth, it wouldn't hurt quite as bad. I'm not sure how well that worked, but, you know. The shirt tails, who wore the ends of their shirts untucked from their trousers, and then there were the roach guards who wore the red stripes. And then, of course, you had our heroes gang from the movie The Gangs of New York, a break-off faction of the Roach Guards, who designated themselves by a blue stripe rather than the guards red, the Dead Rabbits. The Dead Rabbits, as shown in this picture from the beginning of the movie The Gangs of New York, displayed their name by carrying into battle a rabbit impaled on a pike. According to Herbert Ashbury, who wrote the slightly mythical book 
the gangs of New York that the movie is based on, the rumor is, is that the gang got their name because there was a brawl and somebody threw a dead rabbit into the mix and the name just kind of stuck. While the Irish gangs in the Five Points spent most of their time fighting each other, they would band together against one common enemy, the nativists. While the Irish communities in Paradise Square or District were likely a bit more accepting of their own kind, not all Americans were as welcoming. The influx of the Irish was the largest rush of immigrants since the colonial era, and some of the native-born Americans found their increasing presence a threat to what they considered to be their United States. The ships that delivered the immigrants had been referred to as floating fever wards. The cities quickly became overcrowded, as could be seen by the people sleeping on the streets in the Five Points, which led to the development of those type of slums. And to top it all off, they were Catholics and pretty Protestant in America. Those that opposed the Irish immigrants quickly formed a group referred to as the Nativists, and they mostly voiced their disdain in newspaper articles and in political elections. However, we will get to that later. But it should be noted that they too formed their own gangs. Nativist Gangs Turf was just north of the Five Points in a part of New York referred to as the Bowery. Uh, they took on names such as the True Blue Americans, the American Guard, and the Bowery Boys. Uh, this is the type of gang that Daniel Day Lewis's character, Billy the Butcher, would have been involved with. These violent street gangs were quickly noticed and utilized by individuals and groups with political aspirations, and they were most often used during elections. The gangs willingly worked for political organizations, some accepting money, but more commonly, they were promised political power once their patron was elected. During the first meeting of a primary election, which is the most crucial, as the chairman who will run the proceedings is elected, violence often broke out. Gang members could be used to control the meeting hall, which could mean removing the opposition's power players from the hall under the pretense of maintaining order. During the primary election itself, gangs were used to intimidate voters. The hope was that people would be too intimidated by these fighters, as gang members were referred, to approach the polling place, ensuring that the candidate that the gang represented would win the majority of the vote. The elections that these gangs were utilized in could get very heated very quickly as they were dirty and corrupt. Riots were not uncommon. Uh, the first one that is often brought up is the election riot of 1834. However, there were three more in 1835. There was an election riot in 1842 and the Bowery Boy riot in 1857. And of course, there were the draft riots that you saw in the gangs of New York. So now we've discussed the more nefarious individuals of the five points, that being politicians and gang members. However, the majority of the individuals that lived in the five points were just poor, so they couldn't afford to live anywhere else, but they mostly worked legal jobs. So now we're going to turn our attention to how the rest of the five points lived, beginning with where they lived. houses that made up the five points were a testament to the economic depression that characterized the residents of the neighborhood. The number of tenement buildings increased from the 1830s to the 1840s to house the influx that congregated in the five points due to the famine. By the 1850s, the building type was a common fixture of ward architecture. Tenement buildings were typically built from wood before 1850s and were generally two and a half story structures that were renovated from the original apartment buildings that they were. A single building was divided into two to five apartments that are usually atop a commercial establishment run by the landlord. Uh, these commercial establishments were often enterprises such as bars, which supply the house and surrounding populace with alcohol. Such an establishment was run by Mr. Farrell on Leonard Street, who had boarders of himself, his wife, Mr. Kirkland, Mr. Troll, Mr. Duckleys, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Shader, Mr. Powell, and a maid named Rose O'Brien who lived in the kitchen. Privacy was clearly limited in such crowded buildings, and the residents who lived in the tenement often associated with one another in the commercial bar room on the lower level of the building. 
However, with, within tenements, entire families could be crowded into a single room, which they would often share with other residents. This made finding beds difficult. It was not uncommon for the children of the family to sleep on the floor of their apartment buildings on bundles of cloth in place of a mattress. Beyond that, the families were known to allow others to pay for a spot to sleep in their room. These individuals were called lodgers or residents who paid for bed space only. Fortis found paying rent, renting out lodging necessary as the apartments and tenements came at shockingly high rates for the conditions in which the people had to live. Despite the squalor of Five Points tenements, they ran anywhere from five to $10 for a three bedroom apartment. With the high price of accommodations, families struggled to provide other necessities for their families. The Five Points was known as a den of iniquity and its most common vice was alcohol. It quickly became a fixture of everyday life in the Sixth Ward. It was not uncommon to see individuals stumbling their way through the streets in the mid-morning, nor was it rare for the police to rouse the neighborhood drunks who happened to have fallen asleep somewhere in the streets or in Paradise Park. Uh, there was a newspaper ad run in the Sun on uh, Mary Bush and Joanna Tracy, who were woken from the gutter in the Five Points in November of 1833 and both committed while they were still intoxicated. And Tracy thought that she had gone into custody of her own accord rather than being forced into a cell by the police of the Sixth Ward. Alcohol had a devastating effect on society within the Five Points. There was basically a tavern on every block, oftentimes more than one, and the Five Points was known for having the cheapest liquor in town. Bars were often located in the bottom floor of tenement buildings, as I acknowledged uh, Mr. Farrell's in my discussion on tenement buildings, which of course led to inebriated residents, which then in turn leads to accidents like the one that happened at Mr. Farrell's tenement in which one of his residents died from falling down the stairs while drunk. Taverns also became the congregating ground for the seedy underbelly of the city like the grocery store speakeasies that Rosanna Pierce ran that facilitated the formation of the American street gang. Alcohol could also have very dangerous side effects for society. If you look at the graph in front of you, which charts the causes of death uh, as told by coroner's inquest in two sample groups, one from 1833 to 1835 and the other from 1847 to 49, out of 350 coroner's inquests, 53 of those are related to intemperance, which is essentially inebriation. Uh, also, highly inebriated abusers were exceptionally clumsy individuals as well, which could lead to violent accidents like the death of William Brown in June 1848. He entered the sweeps home on Orange Street and then tripped, fell, and hit the corner of the table, an injury that caused a fatal brain hemorrhage and eventually Mr. Brown's death. The fall, however, barely registered for Mr. Brown as he continued to stumble around the neighborhood until stopped by the Sixth Ward police officer named James Watson, who, as he told the story later, was not entirely surprised to see Mr. Brown. Officer Watson described William Brown as having been in town only a short while and being drunk the majority of the time. Alcohol can also affect a person's patience threshold and it can lower their inhibitions, both of which can lead to violent circumstances that aren't necessarily as accidental as the death of Mr. William Brown. And this leads us into the final section of tonight's lecture, Homicide in the Five Points. <laughs> Given the Sixth Ward's very violent reputation, you would expect it to have a much higher homicide rate than at least most of the other districts in New York, and you would certainly expect the homicide rate to go up with the rush of Irish immigration that came in following the years of the potato famine. This is just common sense to most people who would look at the atmosphere of the neighborhood. However, the opposite appears to be true. The graph you're looking at is based off the same coroner's inquest sample groups that I used in the previous graph. However, this one has been broken down into more specific violent death comparisons. What we're going to be focusing on is the homicide one. While we said earlier that one would expect the homicide rate to escalate as the 
that Irish came flooding in during the famine, this does not appear to be the case. In fact, the number remained about the same. Between 1833 and 1835, there were approximately three homicides documented in the coroner's inquest. Between 1847 and 1849, there were four homicides do documented by the coroner. The fact that the number of homicides remained approximately the same suggests that while general crime and violence increased in the five points during the period between 1833 and 1849, this had very little effect on homicides. Homicides typically fell into three categories, romantically motivated, alcohol infused, or both. Romantic violence typically did not fall within the category of homicide, but it did happen on occasion. For instance, Rachel Kelly of 111 Mulberry Street was killed by her husband, Peter Kelly, on June 8, 1848. Dr. Ambinder tells the story of Charles Thomas, who shot a man because he was talking to his paramour. However, more common are homicides that occurred because either the victim or the assailant had been drinking alcohol. This stands true in the coroner's inquest narrative I posted on Carmen covering the death of Andrew Mahan in the 19th century. Logically, this tie with alcohol makes sense because, as previously mentioned, it adjusts the patient's threshold and the general disposition of an individual, as you will again notice in the inquest for Mr. Mahan. In comparison to other ethnicities represented in the Sixth Ward, alcoholism was much more common among Irish immigrants, which Dr. Anbinder ties to some cultural or genetic factors, which then led to a higher number of Irish immigrants being victims of homicide rather than the non-Irish immigrants. All right, well, that's all I've got for you guys this week. I hope you think that you have a nice background on the five points and are going to enjoy or hat or did enjoy uh, Gangs of New York uh, because it's, I honestly think it's a fun movie and it's Daniel Day-Lewis and you can never get enough Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, on Carmen, I put up a couple things that I think you guys will find interesting. Um, I put up a couple maps of New York that outline the different wards. Um, and one of them I put in the video you just watched, but there's another one that's a little different and kind of shows a bit more of New York. Um, there is also the narrative from the coroner's inquest on Andrew Mahan. I think you guys will find that really interesting. It's a real murder that happened in the 19th century, and I think you guys will find it cool, because I did. Um, also, there are free links up for YouTube videos. Uh, there's a BBC America show called Copper, which traces, um, I guess, the careers of these five-point detectives. Uh, it takes place post-draft, but it's actually post-Civil War. Uh, and it's actually really interesting. But before they put up the show on BBC America, they made these short little YouTube videos that are kind of making of behind the scenes type of things. So you can see how they built the set, which their set is very similar to Gangs of New York. I don't know if that's how Gangs of New York made theirs, but it's interesting to watch anyway, because I'm sure other films have used this type of technique. They also did a making of um, video for the history of the NYPD, and it goes into uh, the beginnings of the police department and the New York Police Department in particular. And I think you guys will find it really cool. So feel free to use those and watch them and use them in your discussions because I think they're fun. I hope you guys have enjoyed uh, this kind of switch Dr. Newell and I did. It was really fun for me to make, and I hope that you enjoyed watching it as well. Uh, good luck with all the work you have coming up, and I will see you next week.